Welcome back to We Move Through Stormy Weather, a fish podcast where we compare and contrast songs and the evolution of their jamming styles throughout the band's career. My name is Ryan Storm, and today I'm joined by RJB. RJB is the CEO of Osiris Media. A longtime fish fan, he co founded the Helping Friendly podcast in 2013 and Osiris in 2018. His background is in storytelling and business, which he brings to Osiris to lead the company's growth. He saw his first show in 1995 and has spent way too much time thinking about set lists and jams, as many of us have. RJ, say hi. Hey, thanks for having me, Ryan. Yeah, thank you so much for being on tonight. It's an honor to finally get to sit down and uh, talk some fish with you. Longtime listener of Helping Friendly and uh, Undermine. So very excited to talk some fish. Awesome, man. Yeah, thanks for having me and congrats on getting the show going and pursuing it. It's a lot of work. Thank you. Thank you. So the song we picked for today, um, a long awaited uh, jam titan that I think... um, I've been looking forward to this debate uh, since you picked the song a while back. We're going to be tackling bathtub gin today. Um, And of course, you know, you want to start off, talk about uh, the all timer version that you picked. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I mean, there's so many great versions. That's why I think this, I guess I wouldn't say it's like an underrated jam vehicle, but I think there are so many, amazing versions that are up there with, you know, versions of, of tweezer and, and other songs that, that may come first on the list of, you know, the, the songs you want mm-hmm. to hear. Um, this, this version that I chose was seven twenty nine ninety eight from Riverport. Um, this is, you know, the middle of summer 98 tour. This is just 24 minutes of nonstop jamming. There's no slowing down. There's no, breaks there's really no pauses there's it it seems like the energy picks up from the beginning and it never stops and it's just it it's kind of mind-blowing how it just keeps going and going and it never slows down and it keeps changing you know styles and yeah i I just i love it and it's the show opener no less yeah yeah that's even crazier it's crazy and i mean it just shows that you know during this time they were obviously pretty well, pretty well locked in, you know, um, to show Mm -hmm. up and open this, open the show. But, um, yeah, it's just a, it's a great, it's a great jam. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. It's full, like runaway freight train, no moments of uncertainty at all, uh, in this jam. And I just, the first time I heard it, I was just blown away. And I actually, the first time I heard it, I didn't realize that it was filler on one of the, on the 71598 Live Fish release. So I listened to like an audience recording of it. And sometimes when I'm sleeping, I'll play like quietly, I'll put on like, you know, some Grateful Dead or some Fish and it'll be on shuffle. And I woke up in the middle of the night um, one night, I think it was like, um, I want to say it was like June or July. And I wake up and like, it's the middle of like the like the second half of this, like the crazy funk jam. And I'm yeah. like, it's just the Riverport gin? How what? <laughs> <laughs> and and I went back to bed thinking and then I woke up in the morning thinking I was crazy. And I went on Spotify and it was like, Oh, there is a release of this. Yeah, so yeah. Was, at the end of that of that Portland show, which is, you know, from the same tour and also really, really great. That came out in yeah. I think it got released in 03. Um but a pretty awesome filler. Yeah, no kidding. And yeah, it's, I do wish we had um, the full uh, 729 show because you can never have too much dog log. Yeah, yeah. It's a great, I mean, it's, they were having so much fun that summer, you know, there were all the yeah. the covers. There was a lot of antics. It was, um, it was a and good, expanding a on really the, good tour. Yeah, and expanding on the 1997 funk sound, you know, which, took them in so many interesting directions over the course of that tour and that year. Yeah. I love I, it. I, I, I think, I, I lo- sorry, go ahead. No, I think you can hear the influence of, uh, gins from 97, like the beginning part of this. Um, I think a lot of the late nineties gins start off in the same kind of like, you know, the C major, uh, jam that, you know, at, that reminds me of the went gin because for the went gin, they just took that idea and we're like, we're running with this, you know, that's what we're doing. And so 
it's always cool. I hear like Trey does this lick at the beginning of almost every uh, gin from 97, 98 that just reminds me of the, the great win. Yeah, I actually, so I've listened to this jam, I don't know, hundreds of times, but I, I wrote some notes down when I was listening to it yesterday, and I, I wrote I wrote the same thing just about the Went Gin, because I think there's, you know, there's like a, a pretty solid, I don't know, three to four minutes where he's just kind of pushing that that blissful kind of solo, but it is the same repeating phrase that you hear in the, in the Went Gin. Right. It's or it's at least the same yeah. key, but I think it is like the same phrase. Yeah. Before like, yeah, just before like the 12 minute mark, like the first 12 minutes of the song are just like hose, like upbeat, you know, fantastic jamming. And that's I mean, I'll, I'll talk. I'll introduce. I picked uh, the Magnum Ball uh, gin from 8 nice. 15. I think uh, this one kind of goes in the complete opposite direction. Um, it you know, they're decisively type two. I wrote in my notes decisively type two at like the eight minute mark. Um, and what's cool to me is that in those first few minutes of the jam, the Magna ball one, I guess by the timestamps, because the Riverport one is a show opener. So there's more crowd at the beginning. Um, but it's in the jam at around, uh, four minutes and 20 seconds instead of five minutes and 20 seconds in Riverport. Um, and in those, um, in those three minutes, um, you know, before it starts to go type two, they pack so much in there. And one thing I noticed just Fishman is the leader for all like 22, 23 minutes of this jam the whole time. He's just, it's the John Fishman show. Yeah. Well, and it, because it doesn't slow down. So he, he, I feel like when Trey starts, you know, soloing around that eight or nine minute mark that the whole band is like kind of picking up the pace to keep up with him. And it feels like they're all like kind of surfing on this, on this blissful kind of jam, but Paige is like pounding the keys. Trey's playing this phrase over and over and Fishman is just like never stops, but I don't know how you can play drums for that long without even taking a breath, okay. you know, let alone missing beats. It's John Fishman, man. He was <laughs> he's feeling it in this jam. It's like um in episode four when I I talked to uh, Greg Knight about Sneak and Sally. He does it. The version I picked from that one was the uh, uh, Bill Graham twenty sixteen, 
And Fisherman does a very similar thing in that jam where like, you know, Trey seems like he might want to start to slow down and Fishman just starts pushing the tempo and just goes faster and faster and faster. And it's just, it's, it's all him. It's incredible. It's pretty amazing. And, and uh, did you go to Magna Ball? Were you there? I did not. I wish. Yeah, it was I kind wish. of the last. The la- Yeah, yeah. But that was, you know, that was the last, the last festival up until now. It seems like it's crazy, right? Yeah, almost long time six ago. years ago. Long it's time ago. Crazy. You got to get to the next one. That's that's the that's the plan, you know. If I'm if I'm not at camp, that's the that's the, the plan. Festival festival weekend is usually, um, you know, the weekend that I come home from camp. So I was actually, I was at camp on the phone with my dad, begging him. It was like the day they canceled curveball. It was like three days before I was coming camp. I was supposed to leave camp on the Saturday. And I was like, let's just drive down to Watkins Glen. Like 10 hours, I don't care. Like, let's go. <laughs> and um, I'm like on the phone with him, like begging. He's like, I don't know. And then he's like, oh, curveball's canceled. I'm like, stop saying that to like <laughs> shut me up. Like, no. And then he's like, no, it is. And I was like, really? And I went and I looked and I was like, no. <laughs> yeah, it was real. It was very real. We were almost there. Fall 2018 is um, a pretty good consolation prize, though. It was pretty good. We drove all the way there and had to drive all the way back. But, um, you know, mm. that, that's how it goes. You can bring you can bring the whole family to the next one. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Although it's really nice to, to go, you know, by myself. You can ask my dad. There's nothing he loves better than seeing fish with my brother and I. That's cool. Um, that's when yeah. you're of the age, that's awesome. That's a great, great experience. My brother saw his first one at five. Really? So, and I was 11. Yeah. What show was that? Got uh, um, His first show was uh, 7 22 13 in Toronto. Um, so it was a hometown show. And then my first one was uh, 6 24 12 uh, Blossom. Cool. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. What, what date? When in 95 was your first show? um october 28th which was uh the palace in detroit outside detroit nice, near where nice. i grew up it, yeah when was the next time you saw a show after that did you see more fall 95 shows no i was um because i was 16 so i got i'm not sure why i was able to go to that show actually because i was i drove there with a couple of friends and um at the yeah the next show i saw was at the palace the following year in 96 ah. um because so were you at the Palace in, in 97? Oh, yeah. 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 I, I saw in 97, I got to see, because it was my first year of college. So I got to see Champaign, um, Cleveland, Detroit, Dayton, and Penn State, like in a, in a good, good little run there. Wow. Um, yeah. It was that, really that Champaign amazing. show, uh, we've had two jams from that show, uh, 11, 19, 97, that have been uh, discussed already. The uh, the Wolfmans, and uh, by the time this is out, uh, the 2001 uh, will nice. uh, be out as well. Yeah, that was a so, ma- that was a anyway. magical evening. Magical evening. That was that place was yeah. just um, it was just the energy was was outrageous that night. That was a really fun show. Quite the show. I I did I do want to bring it back to the gin. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. When I was listening earlier today, um I noticed um I don't know if you've caught on to this, but it's not uh noted on fish.net. A manteca tease from Page uh around like 1321 or 22 or something. He plays the bump ba bump, bump a few times on the clav. No, um, I didn't notice that. That's awesome. Yeah, I hadn't catch. noticed it ever before too, but I, I, I find these things when I'm, you know, listening closely to record when I was, you know, doing research for the tweezer episode. Um, I found a cars, trucks, buses tease from page in the two twenty eight Oh three one. Nice. Uh, that's up there now. So and now I just have to get, now I just have to get Scott Marks's attention. Yeah. Well, we we'll, we can make it happen. Wait, but you're, so you, but you play the keys, right? I do. Yes. So, so, so I, I am I am zeroed in on page a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Well, that's um that that moment there is basically right when they start that like electro funk groove that's like lasts for I don't know five minutes or something, right? Yeah. the The next note I have after the Manteca tease is pants are off. <laughs> so. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's crazy because it doesn't, 
like the 24 minutes to me, or I guess 23, what, however you count it, it goes by pretty quickly. There's not a Definitely. moment where you're like, you know, is this like, you know, how long is, how long has this been? I think it just goes by quickly. And then you're like, wow, that was a, that was a wild, wild ride. Absolutely. Yeah. It's the way that they transition from uh, that initial hose jam into the funk is so seamless and so perfect. I just, you know, this is my first time listening to it in probably a month or so, which I'm slacking. I should be listening to it more often. <laughs> um, but Mike and Fish, like, they don't really change what they're playing very much. They stay in a very similar groove, and Trey and Paige seamlessly go from this up, uh, like uplifting. They're playing these arpeggios, uh, kind of in tandem with each other. And that's one thing I noticed. That's a parallel between these two versions. There's some fantastic Trey and Paige uh, interplay in both of them, where one of them will play a little riff, and the other one will catch on, and they'll start repeating it. You know, kind of throwing it back and forth. Um, and it's, that was just. Uh, a really cool moment to me like that transition just so perfect i think the song lends itself to to the Trey and page interplay i'm not sure why i don't know what it is about it but i feel like a lot of these jams and end, end up with a with a lot of page um you know kind of up front which is which is cool that's part of the reason that i think this the song is just it's so fun whenever they get outside of the the song structure you know but it's also like the yes. the crowd is always happy to hear it. It's always a fun a fun one to hear, but you also you just don't know where it's going to go, you know, but you know it'll be Yeah. And it'll be good. Yeah, and it, it, it's one of those songs that works anywhere in the show. You know, it can be first set opener, mid first set, first set closer, second set, encore, wherever. You know, and there's no point where you hear the opening notes to Bathtub Gin and you're upset. You know, <laughs> right. Like, does it doesn't it doesn't ruin a set. Nope, it doesn't. It's amazing. And I think the yeah. um in this version, the the where you're describing when Paige kind of comes in, it's interesting because it seems like Trey kind of makes a conscious decision at some point to like they push this blissful kind of peak, like which sounds like the went gin as we as we talked about. But then he kind of like starts repeating a different little phrase, but he sort of like fades into the background a little bit and Mike and Paige become much more prominent and it seemed like a conscious thing like to kind of drop back a little bit and let and let other people shine which is cool because that you know then there's a whole another half of the jam where Trey's kind of taking a back seat yeah and I mean and I love how summer 98 soundboard sound and I'm I'm happy that there's an official release of this one so I could compare the soundboard recording to both because not all the jams that I have on here are, so you know, if 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 the 1.0 pick doesn't have a soundboard release, I listen to the audience of the 3.01 as well to make it fair. But this one just they sound so crisp, like Fishman's kit sounds amazing. The piano is like it's I really zero in from summer 98, just the piano and the drums. They just sound so incredible. I don't know if you feel the same way, but I just think this. Well, I guess we've talked a lot about this jam, but what um Actually, Ryan, will you tell me about yes. why you why you chose the Magnum Ball yes. version? Because I'm I'm curious. Because I a, a bunch of great shows that weekend. Um, yeah, it's I mean, and there there's some fantastic uh, gins. Uh, you know, when you look at 3.0, especially uh, the last couple of years. You know, the last few, the Mexico 2020, uh, MSG 2019, Fall 2019. All three of those are absolutely top notch versions. Um, and it's one of those songs that has made a real resurgence as a jam vehicle uh, the past uh, bunch of years after, you know, kind of being dormant uh, in early 3.0 as a lot of uh, former jam vehicles were. Um, but this one uh, stuck out to me, you know, it was an added flair to it because, you know, first set jam uh, still in 2015 where huge first set jams like this weren't as common as, you know, they might pop up now. Um, and it's just, the energy of it, you know, similar, it's kind of has a similar runaway freight train energy to the Riverport gin, but also very different because the band sounds so different in 2015 than they did uh, in 1998. Like there's some, like there's some funk sections in uh, the Magnaball one that sound nothing like 
the funk sections in uh, Riverport. And that's just, you know, they play it differently. You know, it, it felt like to me, um, like eight or nine minute mark when they first get into that uh, kind of funky, like the 3.0 funky jam. Uh, it felt to me like it could have come out of like a, like that could have come out of a week of Puck. I don't know if you may have drawn that comparison as well, but that's just, that's mm -hmm. just something I heard. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of tray on the Mutron because 2015 after fairly well. Um, and, you yeah. know, Trey is uh, playing very strongly because of fairly well practice. Um, so just there's so many things about this jam that just it that set it apart uh, for me. And I just I was sitting at my desk, like like vigorously, like bobbing my head to most of it, uh, just loving it earlier. So, I was, you know, <laughs> I think it's a good I think it's a good call. I mean, the it's interesting because the. I mean, if you were to if you were to say that, like, you know, Tweezer is kind of the the opposite of bathtub gin in terms of a jam vehicle in that it's it's such a more laid back, yeah. not laid back, but slower tempo. Right. Like with bathtub gin, you're pretty much always you're going all in and you're going head first and you don't really know where it's going, which I think is um, whereas with Tweezer, you kind of, you know, you kind of know where you're, you don't know where it's going to end up, but you know where you're going, which I think is. It, it's fun um, to have like a little bit of the predictability of like, wow, this, um, this bathtub gin is going to go places because I think the, like the, the one that you picked from, mm -hmm. from Magna ball is that's a set one closer, right. On the, the first night, which um, you know, they like that whole set that was kind of like getting kind of getting into it, right. Getting into the weekend. And then they just, just go absolutely nuts at the, in this set closer. It's just such a, it's always fun. Yeah. And you know, to, and they're all, you can tell they're all feeling it right from the get go. Like Fishman doesn't start the jam in the, as I already mentioned, you know, he sticks out to me this whole version and always, um, but he's not playing the typical gin beat uh, in this jam at all. From the get go, he's doing an atypical, like more hi hat tight beat. Um, and he just, He's t he's immediately like, you know, we're going type two on this. You know, we're jamming this out like he wanted it. You know, who knows if it would have gone type two if Fishman hadn't immediately jumped on it and like urged the rest of the band to break out of the song proper. So that's something really, really cool to me. How even though he may not be playing the actual notes, he can still lead a jam in such a way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it kind of all is is all about Fishman, right? Um, Always Man's named after him for a reason. <laughs> um, well, that's um, I, I appreciate that version. I'm gonna I, now. I have to go back and listen to all of Magna Ball um, because yeah. <laughs> it's just kind of a. It was a pretty. It was a pretty crazy few days, you know, musically. Um, mm -hmm. Didn't really. I mean, the Saturday day set, I guess, was the one time where it was like it felt a little bit less. Um, yeah, but it was this, it's the Saturday afternoon set at a 3.0 festival. You know? Yeah. 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 It was pretty chill, but the antelope at the end, I mean, they, they got into it, but, um, that whole, and that, all three days were crazy. Yeah. And I mean, I think they more than made up for the, you know, pedestrian afternoon set with the two sets that came later in the day. So outrageous, <laughs> you know, and, and I mean, and the chalk dust, um, and the 46 is the 46 days, uh, the 21st or the 23rd. I think the 46 I days was later in the weekend, although, um, yeah, I think it was the, 
Or was it the twenty second? Right? Am I am I really screwing that up? No, no, it's the twenty second. This is Saturday. It was during that oh. uh, second set. Wow, shame on me. Um, it's okay. But the the chalk dust from the first night as well. Yeah. Uh, absolutely phenomenal. There there are a ton of you know besides the obvious the gin and the tweezer pants. Uh, there are a ton of incredible moments from this weekend, and I mean, it's a great finish to, uh, you know. Top five, uh, two or three point for me. I I don't, I don't put summer twenty fifteen as you know the best of the era as a lot of people do. Um, you know I'm a if you see me on the internet or you hear me on previous episodes of my podcast, you know that I am very much uh, a fall twenty eighteen person. Uh, what's your opinion on uh, where summer twenty fifteen ranks uh, in three point that's a good question. I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, I have this, <clears throat> excuse me, I have this problem where like, I think everything is pretty great, you know? Um, so, I agree. so I think like 20, 2013, 2015, 2017 are all probably my, you know, my favorite years, but I did see some shows in 2018 that I thought were, were amazing. I mean, I just, which ones? Um, 1230, I think was the first one that comes to mind. 1229 and 1230 were both, were both great. Um, I got to go in, in 2018 to, to San Francisco and see shows at, um, at Bill Graham, which was really amazing. And, um, I saw shows at Tahoe that, that summer also. So I got to like see a bunch of cool, cool shows that, that summer, but, um, you know, the, the odd year kind of theory that that some people have that I think there, there there's something to that which it doesn't make you know any sense and isn't real but um there's something about that at least you well know, I mean I, th- I think it holds true mostly but I I look at 2017 2018 as kind of a parallel to 97 98 mm-hmm. where you know 2017 was like such a huge year in terms of just the way the band approached shows coming off of the first seven years of uh, 3.0, you know, first set jamming came back in such a huge way. Like at, you know, the Magna ball gin happened and there were a few other examples, uh, but they were, you know, pretty few and far between uh, for the first, you know, big chunk of the era, but, you know, especially with the Baker's dozen, you know, which was the catalyst for all of that. Um, And I think 2018, they took, um, you know, what they learned at the Baker's Dozen that kind of re-energized them um, and took that jamming to just new heights over the course of 2018. And, you know, I know uh, summer 2018 gets uh, maligned a lot. Uh, you know, Trey was dialing in his new guitar amps uh, and stuff, so the tone wasn't the best uh, for most of the tour. Um, but really by the fall, like, oh, that's that's, you know, Fall 2018 is a tour to me where um, you're not getting one jamming style that dominates. And I, I talk about this a lot, um, but, you know, you have a three-night Hampton run. On night one, you have this truly evil, deep space, golden age. Yeah. And then on night three, in the first set, you have one of the biggest peaks of the year in the simple. Yeah, yeah. That was that was a great weekend. Those shows were amazing. Um the Sunday night show was just kind of a, you know, the the double encore kind of, uh, at least for those of us who were all together, it was a, I feel like that, that really said something, you know? No kidding. Yeah. It, <laughs> I can't imagine uh, being in the building at that moment. And I've heard, you know, uh, the cautionary tale of F Zappa 20 who left as soon as more started. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is why you don't leave fish shows early. Yeah. yeah. You can't do it. You can't do it. Um, it's why you have to, you know, enjoy every moment because you, you don't know what's coming next and you don't know when the next time you'll, you'll see them is, you know, and I, exactly. That's 20, especially prevalent now. Yeah. Right now. Now we're, I mean, I can't believe in 2018, I got to go to, I saw shows in Tahoe and San Francisco and then, you know, Meriwether, which is where, cause I lived in DC for a long time. So I always went to Meriwether and then Hampton and Vegas. So that was pretty outrageous um and pretty amazing but the fall of the whole fall tour i think is is really really pretty solid so Mm -hmm. 
I do think summer 2015 has some shows um, that that I go back to a lot that I think I think there are some jams in that summer that are just amazing. Um, in, in addition to all the Magnaball stuff, like the a couple of jams from the Atlanta run, the Hill Devil Falls. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The Chalk Dust Tweezer from Blossom. Mm. Um, there there are several that are just amazing. You know, there's good man man jams in Philly and some great Merriweather uh tweezer. Uh the tweezer N O two tweezer and uh in my opinion, uh you know top top version of forty six days uh yeah. from that Merriweather yeah. show. And a bug, which was just perfect. And then Perfect. the steam. What's the use sandwich? That shows. That shows fantastic. Yeah, that was. It, it was a great year. So, I don't know. I think all the years are great, but but I do think in 2013, I feel like is a is a special year because it felt like things kind of like all fell into place in this yeah. new era. Um, well, that the that's time. the first year that uh, well Trey said uh, in his Ask Trey on Fish Radio. Uh, he said that that was the first year he felt that they had uh, their mojo back. Yeah, and I think that's I think that's pretty clear from the the shows, you know. Yeah, I mean, it, and it's Tahoe Tweezer is obviously, you know, the huge turning point uh, of turning points uh, for that year, and then Red Hot Fall Tour. Really um, incredible. I think it has something to do with that being the year that we started the Helping Friendly Podcast. I think I think so. What you know, month did you start the Helping Friendly Podcast? June, right before. Right and before and what happened in July? I know, I know. Tahoe Tweezer. It's unbelievable. It's, this is a direct correlation. It's direct. <laughs> Should I like? I'm I'm sure I'm sure if uh, if you ask Tom to ask Trey, I'm sure Trey would be like, oh yeah, like that was it. It was it. You know? He 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 may he may say that. Um, to make us feel good. Um, but <laughs> it's a, it's a really amazing year actually. And going back to it is, uh, I mean, there's so much, you know, as you know, this is, uh, we could talk about this all night and going back to, you know, you could talk about all the great shows every year for, I don't know, 20, to, 20 to 30 years. Right. It's just, it's yeah. what, it's what's so amazing about the band and the community. Yeah, and how, you know, we could never get bored, even if, you know, even if they did a tour where, you know, they, they've joked about doing the Groundhog Day tour where they play the same set list, same jams, same banter every show. We could still talk about that tour for hours. Yeah, I, I'm in. I'm ready. You know, yeah, I'm that'd ready be, for it. That'd be that would be a very funny uh, fish stick, you know. <laughs> So they have a lot of good shit. They do, as, as we know. Um, you know, I just, uh, you know, speaking of shtick, you know, their whole, um, the way, just the way they incorporated something like uh, Game Henge uh, into their shows as well. Which I mean, your incredible uh, Game Henge episode of Undermine just came out today. Um, but it, it's so cool listening to. Um, all this stuff from different perspectives of everyone that you're, I know I'm now just fangirling over undermine, which no, I, I appreciate it. it. If, if anyone's listening, who isn't listening to undermine, you should be because it's amazing. Thank you. Thanks for saying that. Yeah, this is um, the, the game hinge stuff and the way that the, you know, the mythology and also the humor um, was sort of baked in from the beginning you know, mm-hmm. all this stuff uh, that, that went on to be much more ridiculous in terms of the humor, the secret language and all that stuff. But, um, you know, in these early years, they were already, it's just, it's still fascinating to me that they didn't try to adhere to any sort of path that they thought would get them commercial success. They were just trying to stay true to themselves and really like just have fun and play really good music. And that's, um, yeah. And, and the fact that they and the fact that they left, you know, strange design off of was it Billy Breathes uh, because they thought um, or was it they left it off hoist because they thought it could be a radio hit. It was one of those two. <laughs> but they but they purposely didn't put it on the album because they thought it could be commercially successful, which is such a cool thing for a band to do. You know, like almost any other band would be like, yeah, put it on like we want to go big. We want it to be on the radio. Yeah, fish is fish is fish. 
Yeah. And I, if you don't mind me asking, when did the uh, the idea for one super podcast uh, come to mind for you guys? Was um, it like something that you've been talking about for a while, or was it like last year you were like, hey, like, what if yeah. we combined? Yeah, it's a good. Um, it, it first came up about a year and a half ago, probably, and that was mostly a few things. I mean, Tom had done one episode a week for his first season, which was long. I mean, he he was really like putting out a lot of shows and keeping up with the content and finding new interviewees and keeping that going. I think that's what first kind of spurred it because we had endless content, but not the same conversations that Tom had. So that was right. part of the conversation. But as we've grown the company, um, w- one of our intentions is to continue to move into other genres of music and to continue to cover kind of broader topics within music. And I think we thought that as a company, we'd be stronger and in a better position if we had one amazing fish podcast than like, you know, three really good fish podcasts. So I think about it in like the long term of what we want to make Osiris into. And if I look at what Osiris looks like in five years, I can see, you know, one amazing dead podcast, one amazing fish podcast, and, you know, dozens and dozens of other shows that some are narrative, some are about bands, whatever. But I think that that was part of my calculus anyway. That's awesome. I love, you know, I love, you know, Osiris does so much good. And I, you know, I love all the podcasts you guys have done and the, like the limited uh, after midnight uh, <clears throat> podcast that you guys did about Big Cypress. Uh, it was phenomenal, and you know I'm an avid listener of 36 from the Vault as well. Nice. Um, it's helped me, you know, expand my dead knowledge and get different perspectives on things. So that's uh, some really cool. You know, Osiris is great. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um. So if I may bring it back around to yes, the jams at hand. Um. I do want to. Uh, there was one part of the Riverport gin uh, most of the way through um, the, uh, the funk part where Paige is alternating between like organ stabs and like clav and stuff where it really uh, kind of had a very similar energy to the uh, Denver 97 ghost. Uh, I mm. think the groove very similar. I mean, that's, you know, late nineties funk groove. Um, but it, it, it was specifically the way they were playing the funk groove really reminded me of, you know, like the the back half of that jam. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, That's another, wow, what a phenomenal first set that that is from Denver. Kidding. Um, Yeah, I think the, it's interesting, because if you listen to 97 and 98 shows at the time, when we were seeing these shows and collecting the tapes, everything sounded so new and different, um, because we were hearing everything fresh. But I think now when you listen back, like there's a lot of stuff that carries over, you know, from 97 to 98. Mm. Whereas at the time, I think we thought it was a totally different sound and a brand new kind of approach, if that makes sense. So I I mean, you also, I mean, I'm assuming you guys also didn't have the luxury of being able to listen to any show you wanted at any time. No, no, definitely not. You had to wait a long time for you know, tapes to come in the mail and whatnot. But it's just, I feel like we, we talked about the Went Gin, the Denver Ghost, um, maybe some other stuff that we've already talked about that's all referencing 97 sounds in summer 98. And I think just in the, if, if you don't listen in the way that we're describing right now, you would kind of think that they sounded totally different. Because in a lot of ways, the music was different and i think the jamming was different particularly because 97 was so focused on you know kind of a singular style Mm -hmm. and i mean and and yeah and that's as i mentioned earlier 98 takes that uh funk sound uh from 97 and just expands on it and it's you know it's by the end of the year there's somewhere between um there's somewhere between you know the straight funk of 97 and the ambient grooves of 99 and it's really cool you know, there are very few other bands that change so much over the course of a year. Like if you compare, 
you know, the Grateful Dead in 72 to the Grateful Dead in 83, totally different band. But you compare Fish in, you know, uh, June 1997 to Fish in December 1997, you know, totally different take yeah. on the funk. You know, so much evolution happens every year, even in a year like, you know, 2011, um, where it was just, you know, uh, they were still getting back on their feet, but they had something like the Storage Jam where you can compare leg one of the summer tour to leg two of the summer tour. It's like night and day. Yeah. You know? And so they have these things, whether it's, whether it's a festival or whether it's, you know, they discover a new sound like they did uh, at the beginning of 97. Um, but their improv, their improvisational style is constantly evolving. It's just so incredible to listen to that every year. Uh, I don't think there's a single year where, uh, God Fish hasn't uh, changed uh, their sound uh, in some way, shape, or form over the course of that year, and just evolved and you know learned from each other and what they're playing. Yeah, I, it's it's pretty. Um, I think in the broader scheme of things, you know, thirty five years or something, it's just incredible to see how much they evolved, you know, from year to year. And, and even mm-hmm. from tour to tour and within tours. I mean, you, you take the, we were talking about the 2015 and 2013, you know, you have, I, I think new material plays a, a big role in that Definitely. as well. You know, you have like 2015 was obviously influenced by Trey's like insane guitar practicing for fairly well, but you also have these new songs that, that come out every every year really of 3.0 and a testament to Trey's constant never ending songwriting and, and Tom mm. continuously giving him good lyrics to build around. Um, but, you know, something like Mercury or, um, or blaze on, you know, those can kind of affect a whole tour, which I think is just, that's which, so different yeah. from most bands. Yeah. And I mean, especially summer 2015 blaze on and no men in no man's land were, you know, thrown everywhere uh in the show you know trying to figure out where it works and i think you know a year like that didn't suffer too much from new song uncertain placement uh syndrome because there were only uh a few that were being played frequently like no men and blaze on mercury was played a few times on that tour shade was introduced at well as well but was only played a few times i think um but then you have a year like 2016 where they introduce a whole album of big boat songs and that really, you know, affects the set list as well. Just like the introduction of Ghosts of the Forest and Cast Foot Vax at the same time yeah. uh, into 2019 really affected uh, the show makeup. And, you know, and now, now, you know, when they come back, those songs will all be settled, you know, into the set list. But then they'll have, you know, the Lonely Trip songs, which I'm guessing... Uh, Fish will be playing at least some of. Yeah, uh, for sure. You know, I'm sure Mike has written more music. Paige might have a couple of songs. Fishman r- might have ass handed too. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I think that's the the thing is, if you're not constantly pushing yourself and innovating, then you know, then you don't get the ruby waves from the summer of 2019. And uh-huh. I think there's there are a lot of you know cynical fish fans who are who are would argue to like, you know, don't play the Ghost of the Forest stuff or don't play the, you know, the solo stuff or why are you playing this slow song or Petrichor just complaining all the time, which is exhausting and, and totally pointless in my opinion. But without that, you don't have those amazing jams like the Fuegos from the summer of 2014 or, mm-hmm. you know, Ruby Waves from 2019, Alpine. right? Yeah. You get these... They, that's what spurs them them forward and it's what's interesting to them so and it's it's also just a reminder as an artist or a content creator whatever you do to not let people's feedback affect you too much because you have to keep pushing forward based on what you believe you can accomplish and i think like fish has done that their entire career i mean can you imagine the like the scene in bittersweet motel you know when trey's reading the the Review, reviews yeah right it's like oh you brought bad reviews yeah and he's like reading about you know he's joking about the quote about you know urinating in fans ears but but you know that obviously that stuff affects you and you know i know that from 
reading reviews of the stuff. We put out tons and tons of podcasts and not all of them are universally loved by everyone. And like, you can't, can't really pay attention to that because you have to keep moving toward your vision. And I feel like Trey and, and all of them are just really good at that. They're, and maybe they're really annoyed by all of it, you know, on the inside or when we don't see them, but <laughs> they seem to just be motivated by their own vision, which I just think is, is a good lesson, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? And, and throughout their career, you can see when, you know, when they're, when they're feeling confident, when they're having fun up on stage, like they don't really care, um, you know, what they're doing. Like uh, you've really seen the past couple of years uh, since, you know, 2015, 16, they've started having like more visible fun on stage than I think we've seen in a long time or ever, you know, even in the nineties, Trey was, you know, he would get in like the zone. And now, now we're like, he's like, even when he's in the zone, like ear to ear, like, you know, in first tube, when he's like jumping around the stage, like a rock star, I saw a video, you know, the SPAC 2019 shows weren't webcast. Um, but I saw a video somebody posted uh, a couple of weeks ago where, you know, for the majority of that tour, Trey was uh, using wireless uh, connection to his amps. So during first tube at that SPAC show, he's just running around the stage like he and Mike are just running laps around the stage while he solos. And it's just it's so awesome to see them having so much fun on stage because like we know that if. If they stop having fun and they stop enjoying it, they're not going to keep touring. Like, I think we've seen after, you know, the hiatus and the breakup and, you know, them being back for this long, if they aren't enjoying themselves up there, you know, they will, you know, they'll pull the plug, which, I mean, I don't think at this point that's ever going to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, it's just so cool to see, you know, them 38 years into their career, you know, their four best friends who, you know, they basically share one singular brain when they're playing music. And they all just, they're having a great time. They come up there, you know, they, what other band walks into a 20,000 seat arena and puts a vacuum on stage? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like that, that's the vacuum bit. Um, while, you know, they used to play it at every show in the early nineties. That's definitely something that could have been left in the club and the theater era. Right. But, they're they're so unapologetically themselves. Yeah. Like their first show at MSG, they did the bluegrass mini set. Yeah. Like, you know, who does that in arena in an arena? Right. No one. Right. It's it's incredible. It is. It is. And it's a I think that is kind of um you can see that same kind of uh quality, I guess, through a lot of Trey's solo stuff, whether it's Ghost of the Forest or his ventures into orchestral you know, stuff and, and Broadway, he's like, he's pretty unafraid of, um, at least on the surface, pretty unafraid of, of exploring new things. And we talked about that on the, the game hinge episode of undermine that you were talking about earlier, Matt mentioned that he kind of embraced early on this, like fail fast mentality. You know, there's like a lot of song segments and pieces of different songs. And if they didn't fit, like, you know, he just moved them around or got rid of them or put them somewhere mm -hmm. else. It wasn't like such a, he didn't, I think what Matt said, he didn't feel like beholden to like this, you know, idealized version of a song. It's just like, if this thing doesn't work, then move on to the next thing. And I think that's a, I don't know. I feel like I've learned a lot of good lessons from listening to fish, not just, you know, how awesome the jams are. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, you know, you, you can listen to fish and, you know, not absorb any of that stuff. But like, if you, you know, you dig deeper into the band and you look at them, like as people up there playing music, like, you know, what other band has ha had the same lineup since 1985 and is still innovating their sound to the degree that fish is today. Like, you know, it's, it's so crazy that they all still like each other like that after, you know, playing together for so long, like, almost any big band I can think of now, like, you know, even if they're still playing it together, there's like, Oh, like this member hates the other member, you know, like there's in the, in the surviving members of the grateful dead, there's like the beef between Phil and the drummers or whatever it is. Right. Right. Um, and it's just, it's so cool to see that these four guys 
who still love playing with each other and love being with each other. You know, they're still having fun on stage, you know, this late in their career. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And and hopefully we'll be able to hopefully we'll be able to see a show at some point, you know. Yes, exactly. I, I hope to someday be able to take my kids to see fish. You know? <laughs> That's a great, I like that. I like that goal. There's That's the, there was the joke uh, last year when Adam Levine uh, posted the, from Maroon 5 posted the video of him playing Divided Sky. And it's like, oh, it'll be Fish and Co. with Adam Levine on guitar. And everything will be really slow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because, because Paige decides that, you know, he doesn't want to play fast anymore. <laughs> Man. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's, that's wild. Um, yeah, I like, I like that. I like that goal. I'm into Yeah, it. It's just, yeah, it's, it's awesome. And I, you know, I think they'll be around for decades to come, you know? Like, yeah. Even, and, and it's, it's cool to me while they, they may not be, um, they may not be playing as fast as they used to. They may not be playing as tight as they used to, but as I mentioned before, like they, they're innovating, their improvisation is growing and changing every year still, you know, they're not coasting on, you know, the wave of, you know, uh, the funk grooves of the nineties, you know, they're, they've, they've now reached this thing, which tying it all back to the topic, um, <laughs> that listening to, uh, Riverport, uh, versus Magna Ball, yeah. Jin, um, you know, Riverport has pretty much two distinct sections and it does those two distinct sections so well uh you know you have the hose part and then you have the funk part mm -hmm, mm -hmm. magna ball for me moves from idea to idea like so many great 3.0 jams where they 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 land on an idea they explore it like that initial um crazy big peak before they leave the song structure um it, they they tackle that idea they explore the idea there's a lot packed into those few short minutes. And they're like, okay, we've explored that. Let's move on to the next thing. Let's find, you know, something else here to go. And they're constantly doing that in jams nowadays. And that's just, it's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. I think the, the whole Magna ball experience is again, not to tie it all back to the early days, but I do think that they kind of planted those seeds of the, the outdoor shows, the community vibe, the, the just, you know, experimentation of these kind of early festival like shows. And I think that's where you see things like we saw it. I mean, almost all of the festivals, right. But most recently Magna Ball where things just were so much more experimental and stretched out and, you know, nobody, nobody had any rush to go anywhere, which is just such a, mm -hmm. such a luxury. Um, I think you can hear it in that, in that jam for sure. Yeah. And I mean, and there's always that, that that festival secret set that always does so much for the band um you know because they they sit there you know the the last two uh the uh storage jam and the drive-in jam have just been them going in an enclosed space and they're like okay we're just gonna screw around for an hour yeah and, and it's cool because they get to try out things uh you know as i mentioned before the storage jam changed their uh jamming sound in 2011 so much uh, and it's all over even the next day, like uh, the third night of Super Bowl. There's storage jamming style. Like they go into space, like in a whole bunch of different jams. There's jams in the first set. There's, you know, it's it's everywhere. And that was like crazy for 2011. That's why I love that show so much. Um, but yeah, festivals are just, you know, it's an essential part of Fish. And, you know, I, I off the top of my head, I can't name another band that does a festival without a single other act on the bill. You know, there was, was it uh Clifford Ball or Great Went where they had the orchestra? Yeah. Or whatever I think was. that was Clifford Ball. So, but <clears throat> the majority of their festivals have yeah. just been, you know, we're going to play at this place that some, like, you know, that could host, you know, we could set up four stages and have like during the day support acts and a late night and whatever, but it's just fish. One thing I would like to see them do though is do a fish festival, but with like all of their solo acts as well. Nice. So like fish. So there's like there's fish every night, but like you know, late night ghosts of the forest, uh, one night, and then another night, you know, late night oysterhead, and you get tab, and you get Vita Blue, and you get Mike Gordon Band, and 
you know, bring yeah. in like, bring in like, you know, the meter men with page again, like get all these cool, like, you know, maybe one off, uh, one off acts that include members of fish and get them together for this thing. And then, you know, maybe have sit-ins with fish, even though they don't usually do that. Um, I do want to, uh, see uh Derek Truck sit in with them after watching him and Trey play together at Lock in the twenty nineteen. I want Derek to sit in uh for a set with Fish. Yeah, that sounds cool. I like that idea. Um that's a good that's a good idea. Um the the Derek Trucks Trey thing is 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 pretty cool. He uh I think they could they could do a lot together. I want to hear him rip a maze. Yeah. It could happen. Or, Who know, knows? Talk to us or, you know, it it could. Anything can happen. And you know that's one of the cool things I love about Fish because if you look at a band like, you know, the Grateful Dead or Dave Matthews band, they have sit-ins all the time. You know, like yeah. constantly. And with with Fish, they come so infrequently that it's it's so special when it does happen. Obviously it happened more in the 90s, but now like, you know, the last time somebody sat in with Fish was uh I think Bobby in 2016. It's wild, right? They don't yeah, and it, they don't it, feel it, the it, need to have anyone else involved. Yeah, and it's cool. I I do think, um, you know, Trey should sit in with Dave Matthews Band again because he hasn't since two thousand eight, and I want to hear Dave Matthews Band with Trey play Julius. Hmm. I think that band could do Julius really, really well. Nice, I Especially like it with the horns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Um, and so just to to wrap up on the gin topic, um, both of them have a uh, pretty nice uh transitions uh back into uh the end of gin i will say the riverport one is uh smoother than the magna ball one you know uh the jam kind of starts to fade and without wasting like a second trey's like all right like you know we're fading that's it we're going back to gin he like and before he's finished that phrase the rest of the band is in gin with him and it's so cool like just in a couple of seconds I don't know. It, it takes them no time at all. They were they were incredibly, incredibly locked in, you know. And then again, like the show opener, pretty wild. Exactly, exactly. That could be you know a tent pole jam of a second set, you know. Uh, and and the Magna Ball one uh, is a bit rockier because they were in a different key, and you know Trey played it in that key f- first. Um, oh, it was. He first reintroduced the gin melody a little bit over the jam that they were playing at that time. And that was a really cool moment uh, just before the 21 minute mark. Um, And then fish starts slowing the jam down, which then was a little bit bumpy. And then they, you know, they landed uh, in the song. I've heard worse. (laughs) Yeah, certainly. Um, But both and and amazing, you know, versions that, that we didn't touch on. Um, dozens if not if not more i mean there's so oh, many so many, so many yeah, great there's, ones. there's there's every every episode you know there's so many different jams and i'm definitely eventually you know once i've gone through the catalog i'll end up going back you know i'll have another gin episode at some point i'm already planning a, a sub 20 minute tweezer episode specifically like so you know nice. there's, there's talk forever about i like this it band. It's, i like it's it amazing i like yeah, it so just yeah, I think that's uh, it's a great place to wrap up. Just want to say thank you so much, uh, RJ, for coming on uh, this episode. It's been an absolute pleasure and an honor uh, to talk to you about Jen. Yeah, man, thank you so much for for having me, and uh, congrats on, on on the podcast. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening to this episode of uh, We Move Through Stormy Weather. Have a fantastic day, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>